Let's go ahead and pray, and then we're going to kick off a new series today. Lord, we thank you and praise you, and as we dive into your word on this new series we've entitled Freedom, Lord, we pray that you use this to truly set people free to live for you with everything that's within them. That, Lord, you would stir our hearts with a passion to be about what's on your heart, Lord God. Would our hearts break for what breaks to your heart? Would our hearts ignite for the things that ignite for your hearts? Would we live our lives with passion, going out and telling the world about what you've done for us and how you've changed our lives? We were once slaves to sin. We are now free to live for you in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen, amen, and amen. So today we're going to kick off this new series called Freedom, and uh, I'm going to share with you really some foundational material about our identity. We talked about that a little bit last week as our identity as people who God's called to live in community, and we're going to look at some different facets of that because we need to understand who we are and how we're wired as human beings so that we can begin to walk in the freedom that God has given us. We need to also understand the challenges and the things that hold us back because of our very nature and what Christ did in our lives to bring us to that place where you can walk in freedom. I don't know about you, but when I first was um, getting ready to become a believer, I was not a believer at that time. When I thought of other believers, I was like, man, I don't want to be a Christian. Those people are boring, right, man? I'm about getting high. I'm about drinking. I'm about partying. And that stuff's real good, but I feel hungover every day. What the heck's going on, you know? But I mean, that is no way to live right? And then I looked at them and I thought that was the boring way to live. Well, I get to wake up every morning happy, joyous, and free, no hangovers. It's a very good thing. Our God is good. In fact, he is great and awesome. So as a pastor, and even before I was a pastor, I would always pray a prayer much like the one I just shared with you. I would pray for God to align my heart with his. Lord, would my walk, would my life, would my spirit, would my mind, would my will, would my emotions be in alignment with what your heart is? And Lord, at the same time, would my heart break for the things that break your heart? That I would have a passion about engaging in those things and standing against them in a very loving and healthy way and saying, Lord, break my heart for the things that break your heart. I often share the verse, and in fact did last week, Genesis 126. It says, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. I spoke about how it speaks to our identity. It speaks to our purpose, and it also really relates back to our prayer. It's part of how we're created. It's what defines us. You were created and formed in the image of God. We were not created to be first. We were created to be second, right? We we're created to worship God. In fact, the Westminster Catechism says this, telling us a little bit more about our purpose in life. It says, our purpose is to worship God and enjoy him forever. Amen. To worship God and enjoy him forever. So my prayer would really surround for you and for I, Lord, make our lives an accurate reflection of who you are. Yes. Wouldn't that be a great way to live? Lord, may our lives be an accurate reflection of who you are. We were created and formed in your image. He created us as worshipers. And just as I shared last week that he created you to live in community, he created you to worship. And at the heart of this freedom series really revolves this tension around worshiping the one true God and worshiping idols, as we'll describe them in the days and weeks ahead, right? Because you were created to worship, we as human beings will find something to worship even if it's not God. Amen. In our generation, we generally don't call it worship but it's worship nonetheless. As we start to dive into it, you'll see that a little bit deeper in the weeks ahead. We will find something to worship. So worshiping is part of our operating system. It's part of our very DNA. It's part of who we are. And when we surrender our lives to Jesus, we also become a part of this great mission, this Acts 29 kind of mission to go out there and tell the world about who Jesus is and what he's done in our lives with the hope that they too will come to know him as their Lord and Savior. Because guess what? If we believe that there is a heaven and a hell, there is no more important mission. There is no more more important message. We need to be about the kingdom business. Would you agree with me in Jesus' name, right? 
the information we have is too amazing not to be shared. So as I pray for alignment with God's will, I know I'm called to be a worshiper who lives in community, who lives a life of mission to tell the world about Jesus. This is our identity and makeup as a believer. Identity, worship, community, mission. This is what you were created for. Foundationally, as a believer, do you grasp that? If you want to learn more about that and you don't know a lot about it just yet, maybe you're new to the faith and want to supercharge your faith, we have our growth track that kicks off the first Sunday of every month. There's a bunch of people in there right now. They're learning about identity, worship, community, mission, how they can figure out what their own personal God-given mission is and how they can live that out as a believer to have fulfillment and success in life. If you're looking to take your spirituality to the next level, sign up for that. Use the app or stop by the next step station. Plug in and begin to grow in your faith. You were not created to be stagnant. So why then does our lives so often get derailed? We know as believers these things. You all pretty much knew it. You were all shaking your head just a minute ago. Yes, this is what I was created to do. This is why I'm here to worship God, enjoy him forever, and tell the world about him. So why is it that we so often get derailed? Remember the second part of my prayer? Lord, break my heart for what breaks yours. What breaks God's heart? Anybody want to venture to say it? Sin, we're in a good place today. Come on, Jesus, first service has it going on. The three-letter word, not a four-letter word, sin, S-I-N, the ultimate sin, which is the rejection of none other than Christ, right? Amen. That's the ultimate sin. One of the ways in which freedom is defined by Webster's Dictionary is the state of not being imprisoned or enslaved. The state of not being imprisoned or enslaved. It is sin that enslaves. It is sin that brings death. It is sin that separates us from God and from each other, right? Yet there is these glorious truths in the Bible like that found in John chapter 8, 31. It says, Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if, say if, Amen. if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth, say truth, and the truth, you guys are pretty slow. I thought I had you there for a minute. You were flowing with me and then, and the truth will what? It will set you. They answered him, we are the offspring of Abraham and we have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free, right? So the question mixed in there, God gives us the answer and then they end up asking a question. So what scripture reveals and one truth that I'm going to need you to accept as a believer is that we are all sinners in need of a savior. Amen. We are all sinners in need of a savior. Does that mean when your baby's born, it's going to come out and be a sinner? Yes, right? You don't have to teach a baby to sin. It don't take too long before they start, mine, 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 right? I mean, it's in our very nature from the beginning, right? This is who we are as human beings. It's something that we need to accept. And the second thing you need to accept is that Christ came to set you free. We're all sinners enslaved. We are all sinners in need of a savior. It is Christ who comes to set us free. Scripture even tells us where we can find the truth. It says we can find the truth by abiding in his word. Abiding in his word. Spending time in his presence. Hanging out with Jesus. Going to small groups and learning about Jesus with other fellow believers and growing together in our relationship with Christ. Attending church like you're doing today. Getting the word of God within us because it is truth. See, what happens, though, is in our day and age, we bombard ourselves with like four to six hours of screen time every day that stands in opposition to the 15 minutes of word time that we get each and every day. So oftentimes, we don't act like believers because we're getting so much stuff sewn into us by the world rather than God's word, and then all of a sudden, we start to become very lukewarm Christians. Is there some truth in this, right? We start to believe the world because we're allowing it into us so much. And that's part of the plan and tactics of the devil. Remember that we are in a world at war, right? The devil wants to deceive us and he doesn't have to turn you into a Satan worshiper. He just has to keep you this far from the truth. That's all he has to do. 
He needs to keep us just mildly deceived. He needs to keep us enslaved. Yet you might say, like the Jews in that passage, Eric, I am free. I live in the United States of America. Freedom, right? right? Isn't that our mantra? I'm free. I don't have to worry about that. I've never been enslaved. If you continue to read on in John chapter 8 and hear Jesus' answer to them, it's relevant to us today as well. Truly, truly, I say to you, you had to say it twice because we're knuckleheads and we don't believe sometimes, right? Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So the son sets you free. If he does, you will be free indeed. We've all been slaves to various sins in our life. And one of the truths that I need us to acknowledge as we begin to read these words is that um, generally speaking, especially if it's spiritual in nature, no amount of willpower helps you overcome a deep stronghold sin in your life. Amen. It just doesn't work that way. What the scripture is saying is that slaves don't generally free themselves. Can you acknowledge that? Isn't there truth in that? Even if you're imprisoned, if you're in jail, generally speaking, they put up all these barriers to contain you. You are not getting out. You need a force outside of yourself that is stronger than the strong man that is holding you captive to be able to come in and whip his butt so that you can be released and set free, right? Does this make sense to you today? So you need a power outside of yourself. So groups like AA, which were founded on a Christian purpose initially, and then maybe made some concessions that I wouldn't totally agree with along the way, they say you need to believe in a power greater than yourself to restore you to sanity. That's actually pretty close to being spot on biblically if you think of it, right? Now, if you enslave yourself to another power that's not Jesus, you could get in worse trouble than you were in the first place, right? So you have to be very careful about what higher powers you choose. Uh-oh, I see some head shaking. You have to be very careful about what higher power you choose to free you because sometimes the devil's a liar and he will use that to enslave you at the same time, right? So we need a power greater than ourselves to restore us to sanity, to bring us to a place of truth, to bring us to a place of understanding. That power for Christians is none other than Jesus Christ, the son of the living God who died on a cross and rose again that we might have life. He comes to set you free. It said it in that verse. If the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And some of you have experienced that. Praise God. Praise God. So we're examining the very nature of who we are as human beings. If you reflect on where we started this year, it's been very intentional on my part and on the part of the elders and the staff to take a journey in a very specific way. We started out in fasting and praying, right? Amen. I pray you're continuing on in that. Don't let it slip. Make that part of your life if it previously wasn't. Continue to dive deep in that, right? And then as we got out of that prayer series and we were talking about deep things like binding and loosing and the power of spiritual warfare and other things of that nature, we were teaching ourselves how to pray because in this series, Freedom, we're about to confront some strong men. We're about to confront some things that really do bind us and hold us back from being the people that God wants us to be. See, the devil may not possess your soul because you're a believer in Jesus Christ, but I certainly believe he tries to oppress us all the time. He tries to put obstacles in our path, and we need to know how to war against him. We need to understand our own nature and who we are and what power we hold as believers in Jesus Christ so that we can combat these things and more than just fight it and just barely stay in the fight so that we can advance the kingdom of God, so that we can be free. For freedom, you have been set free. You're no longer slaves to the law of sin. You have been free to live for Christ. How beautiful is that? Christianity does not have to be some drudgery of just getting by. God created you to be overcomers. I hope you believe that in Jesus' name. Like five of you are excited. Hallelujah, hallelujah. It brings us back to that self-care issue I talked about last week. If we are jacked up, how good can we be to others? Amen. Yes. 
If we are messed up, how good can we be to others? The next series, we're going to talk about loving your neighbor. That's going to be the series that we're going to do after this. That's going to lead us into Easter. We're going to be living out the mission of God in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, in our communities. But if we're all jacked up going out there sinning just like the world and dealing with all the issues of the world, what do we have to offer? Man, but if you've been set free, oh, Lord, help us. May we not contain ourselves. So let's just spend a little more time discovering who we are. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. So he's revealing to us a few things here. He's revealing to us part of our nature. He says, may your whole spirit, soul, and body be remain blameless until the coming of the Lord. We as human beings are triune beings, just like God who created us and formed us. We talked about it last week, how God in three persons represents perfect community and communion, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the context of community, right? In the same way you and I as believers, as human beings, by our very nature are triune beings, spirit, soul, and body. He's also addressing a bit of an issue right from the get-go. Why why does he have to pray for us to remain blameless? Because sin is real, right? It's a challenge. We're all faced with it as part of our human nature. Even as believers, we are plagued by sin, but now we have the power to overcome it by the power of the Holy Spirit, where previously we did not, where no human willpower would be enough. God can break us through that power outside of ourselves that is greater than ourselves. We'll be faithful to do it. Amen, amen, and amen. So we're created in the image of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? So you're saying, Eric, how can we two be three things in one? So I had the steamer on earlier. Did y'all see the steam, right? Y'all saw the steam just a little bit earlier? So water exists. There's a lot of things in nature that exist as three things in one, right? Water H2O exists when heated as steam, as we saw earlier. It exists at room temperature in water form, right? And then when it's cold, it exists as ice, right? Very simple illustration, three in one. You two are the same way, spirit, soul, and body. We are three things at the same time. Is this all making sense to you so far, right? More aptly put, we are spirit beings who have a soul, which consists of our mind, our will, and our emotions, who live in a body. By your very nature, you are a spiritual being. When our spirits are aligned with God's spirits, it tends to bring our mind, will, and emotions and our bodies into proper order. When we do things out of order, our lives tend to get pretty messed up. Would you agree with me, right? It happens that way. God made it in a perfect reason. When we sin, it takes us to the point of death. Ultimately, all sin leads unto death. But God promises us by the power of his son who defeated hell, death, and the grave that we can be born again because guess what? Dead things like our dead spirits don't come to life on their own. Amen. We need to be born again of the spirit and many of you have experienced that. You've surrendered your life to Jesus and there was this renewed spirit and the things that used to interest you no longer interest you like they do. You feel called to live for God all the days of your life and tell the world about what he's done for you. Many of you have experienced that. If you haven't, I'm gonna give you a chance to do that this very day. So we are all sinners in need of a savior. We have this need to be born again. So a little bit more about who we are as human beings. That's our spirit that is dead. It comes alive in Christ. So our mind, Proverbs 2.10, for wisdom will come into your heart and knowledge will be pleasant in your soul. So your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. So in this verse in Proverbs, it says that wisdom will come into your heart. Wisdom is of the Lord. God bestows us with wisdom. Knowledge can be from the Lord too. Next week, we're going to talk about the tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life, right? So knowledge comes in various forms. Too much knowledge, even good knowledge, can puff us up and turn into sin, can it not, right? 
and then all the knowledge itself also can oftentimes become a very bad thing in our lives, right? It seems that knowledge, when left unto its own, tends to revert to the evil side rather than the good side in the lives of most human beings. Am I correct in saying that, right? So knowledge, your mind, your will, and your emotions, your mind is that place of wisdom and that place of knowledge. Now your will is a place of decision. Job 7.15, my soul would choose. It's a place of decision. Now, is your will being controlled by the Spirit of God or is your will being controlled by the things of this world, by your fleshly nature? In all of our lives, I'd venture to say there's a little bit of both, right? There's certain areas of our life that are still a struggle, that are, the flesh seems to be winning, and there's certain areas of our lives where our will is in perfect alignment with God's will, where we make those good choices, where we remember that we're saved, that we're believers in Jesus Christ. But he wants to help you in those areas of struggle. Maybe he will free you even this very day. Sadly, at times, people's wills are controlled by demonic powers and principalities. I do that which I do not want to do, even though I know I'm a believer, right? Amen. So as an addict, I remember, full-blown believer, still struggling in my addiction. Lord, help me not to repeat these behaviors again today. And sadly, I would repeat them day after day, even as a believer, until one day, freedom came. Some of you need that freedom. I'm here to tell you, God is here to bring you freedom today. Numbers 32. If a man vows to the Lord or swears by an oath to bind himself by a pledge, he shall not break his word. The decisions we make are binding in the spirit realm. You have to understand this. We're going to dive a lot deeper into this into weeks ahead. If you open doors through your decisions, giving rights to demonic powers and principalities to come, you are allowing that to happen. You open up your door, the strong man's going to come in and he's going to steal your stuff. Yes. He's going to take you for a ride. And that comes through decisions usually, right? Somebody offers you, let's go smoke some weed together. You got to make a decision. Are you going to go smoke weed with them or are you not? Somebody offers you, let's go drink together. Are you going to go with them or are you not going to go with them? Somebody winks at you and looks really cute and says, why don't we go grab some coffee? But you're married. Woo. Why y'all, y'all getting quiet now? You better say, no, no, no. There's this other thing called run, 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 right? Another three letter word. <laughs> so when you see that happen, you better run in the opposite direction. Because your choice to go grab some coffee, the devil might start stirring up some other stuff called lust in your heart and mind. And before you know it, you're having conversations that you shouldn't be having conversations with, with people that you shouldn't be hanging out with. And it all starts with good intentions, but you allowed your will to get in there, your human nature, your fleshly nature. That's why it's so important that God tells us in the beginning, we need to abide in his word. We need to stay close to him. We need to be prayed up. We need to be fired up. We need to be spiritually built up because the devil seeks to take us out. And he looks for those moments of weakness that we'll keep talking about. He looks for our destruction and it's our will that takes us there. But sometimes you make that decision and you say no and you foundationally stand against something and all of a sudden God opens up the door in a good direction as well, right? He'll take you to the next place. I don't know who that was. Was that Joey? You're fired. I'm teasing. <laughs> oh, goodness. God is good. First Chronicles 22, 19. Now set your mind and heart to seek the Lord your God, right? Amen. So that's the opposite of what I was talking about. If you set your heart to seek the Lord your God, then guess what? Things will start to work out for you. Amen. Mind, will, and emotions. Emotions, joy, anxiety, anger, Freedom. What are your emotions? How are you living those things out, right? They can control your decisions at times, right? If that lust bubble starts to take over, it could take you to some bad places, as we just described, right? How about the guy in the Bible that was so hungry that he gave up his birthright for a bowl of soup, right? I'm so hungry, I'm going to die. You Americans need to fast a little bit more, right? We need to fast a little bit more. We're not going to die, right? We let our emotions get in the way. That's why the Bible says, be angry and sin not, right? The sin is not necessarily in being angry. There's some things that we should be angry about, right? But don't let it lead unto sin. 
Is this all making sense to you today? You tracking with me? We're almost there. Mind, will, emotion, spirit, soul, body is our last one here today. It's pretty evident we all have one, right? We all have one. We're all here. It was meant to live on forever, but because of sin, we are in continual decline. Our bodies might reach their peak in our generation somewhere around age 30 and then continue to begin to fail us from there. For men, we start to lose hair on our heads and start to grow it in our ears and other weird places. It's weird. It's really, really weird. Our hair turns gray. We no longer see as well. Our skin begins to wrinkle. The ground begins to cry out for dust to return to dust. We as human beings seek out all kinds of fountains of youth, right? Botox, silicone. Come on, all kinds of crazy stuff that people in Hollywood be doing right now that make themselves look really, really freaky. Just age gracefully. Come on, Jesus, it'll be okay. But our quest should always end in one place. Our hope is found only in Jesus, the one who saves your spirit, redeems your soul, and one day will give you a new body that will live on forever in eternity in heaven that will never age, that will never pass away, that will never fail. So in a second, I'm going to call the band back up. But before I do, I have one final analogy just to put it all together and show us how this works. Let's pick on somebody. Let's pick on somebody. Okay, I'll pick on you. No, I'm just teasing. No. Okay, let's pick on the smokers in the room. Some of y'all be smoking. You'd be hiding it on your way into church. Come on, Jesus. You'd be like, oh, I'm gonna be, you know, those believers can't know I'm doing it. It is not the worst sin in the world, okay? You might get to heaven. You'll just smell like hell when you get there as a believer. It's all good. You're going to smell bad when you get there. It's okay, but this is not a <laughs> this. <laughs> oh boy, how do I go back to this now? <laughs> so where does it start, right? Let's, let's take this thing and play it out for a second. None of you who smoke today and are probably addicted to smoking after a number of years, when you took the first smoke or the first puff of a cigarette, thought it would end up where it's at now. You know, I know many smokers in my life. Thank God I've never smoked. I, I think I would have been a chimney immediately. You know, I smoked weed and it was bad enough and awful. But if cigarettes, I mean, nicotine is one of the most addictive substances on the planet. It is not an easy thing to get over. I would definitely put it in that category of stronghold. If you smoke, I still love you in Jesus' name. I mean, it's a difficult, difficult thing, but God does want to help us get over those things, right? So when we first start, it usually starts rather innocently or maybe even from peer pressure or desire to feel cool or who names it. There's a variety of different reasons why a person might pick up the cigarettes for the first time, right? But they take that first smoke and all of a sudden there is this rush of endorphins and serotonin and other chemicals that begin to go to the brain and it feels really good. And we're like, wow, that actually felt really good. Let me do another one. But also with things like smoking, there's these moments where even right from the beginning, you know that there's sin in it because for, I know I tried a couple cigarettes and the first thing I did was started coughing the second I, I did it when I was a teenager. Anybody had that experience, right? I think Mary Jo's dad made her brother like smoke like a whole pack of cigarettes at once. So he was puking and all kinds of stuff to kind of turn them off from it. But you, you know, you, you get that, but then instantly you cough. So there's this sin glimpse that's in the midst of it, right? So then the next time you pick up cigarettes, you don't reach that same high that you had the first time, so to speak. So you got to do more than you did the first time, right? And then all of a sudden, before you know it, you look back and you're enslaved to it. You want to stop. I've never heard a smoker come to me and say like, Eric, I just want to keep on smoking. I mean, I've never, ever had a smoker come to me and say that. They're always like, I want to get over this and I don't know how to do it because nicotine is a trick, right? It gives you this little boost when you first start, but it's one of the most addictive, enslaving subjects. I've seen people get off a of heroin and not be able to get off of cigarettes, right? So what ends up happening is it builds up inside of you and all of a sudden it becomes a dependency. It becomes a slavery that is over us, right? And what does every slavery want to do? What does the devil always want to do? He wants to take you out. So all of a sudden, as I described, that first set of cigarettes is not as enticing as it was. You need much more to get to that same place and maintain that habit that you now have that is a stronghold and a bondage, right? And then before you know it, I remember my great-grandmother, my grandmother actually, Grandma Arlene, I remember going to her house with an oxygen tank by her bed, having to help pick her up as a young child because she had emphysema, trying to help her get to the restroom so that she could go to the bathroom 
because she couldn't get there herself and she had to have an oxygen tank and she was literally drowning inside of her from emphysema because the devil always wants to take you out. Sin always wants to kill you. It always wants to take you to that extreme in the end and it always starts out so good. When someone gives you that glimpse across the room, it feels so good, but you know that you shouldn't be talking to them. When you smoke that cigarette for the first time, it feels so good. When you have that first drink, it feels so good. That's the trick of the devil. If it felt nasty from the beginning, we wouldn't do it, right? So the devil tricks us with this fruit that looks good on the outside, but as a way of addicting us and enslaving us. Some sins are much more sinister than cigarettes and death comes much more rapidly in our lives by putting them into practice, right? We're all susceptible to them. Band, would you please come back out if you can hear me? Satan made them that way to damage our bodies, to addict our minds, and to diminish our spirits. Would you rise with me and bow your heads and close your eyes? Thankfully, God had a different plan to put Satan's head under his heel and squash him. Father, as we've gathered together today, for some, this was a lesson that reinforced their understanding of who they are. For others, it may have been new material. Lord, I pray we would all come to that acknowledgement that we're created and formed in your image to be worshipers of you. But Lord, sin creeps in and so easily deceives and takes us off track and ultimately seeks to enslave us and bring us to a place of bondage where we can't get out on our own and we are, as believers, have come to the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding that we can't get over these things on our own. And I don't know what your sin is. I know the ones that I still struggle with. Maybe God will bring them to your mind right now. We need a power greater than ourselves from outside of ourselves to bring those keys to set us free. Father, I pray you'll begin to do that right now, this very moment that you'll begin to set people free as they beg you right now, oh God, to free them from those things that enslave them, that they'll not relent, that if, if they don't get an instant victory, and I pray they do, I pray that it happens right here, right now, but I pray that they would lay their head to bed every night as I did until you deliver them from that which enslaves them and say, Lord, help me to not do this again tomorrow that they would fill themselves with the things of the spirit, that they would read your word, that they would spend time with you, that they would get connected in community, that they would continue to be here when we gather together as saints on the weekends, that we would celebrate with others in baptism, that we would be baptized ourselves, that we would make our lives about the priorities of the kingdom. Lord, would you ignite our hearts with that which you love and would you harden our hearts and make them um, you know, just reject the things that are not of you. Would you break our hearts with that which breaks yours, especially in our own lives so that we could be of maximum usefulness to you in sowing into the lives of others. So I'd ask you this very day, have you surrendered your life to the one who can save you? Have you surrendered your life to Jesus and said, Lord, I need you. I believe, Jesus, you are who you said you are, the son of the living God, the one who could set you free from this life and into eternity. If you haven't, I want to pray for you, and I want to promise you that I'm not going to do anything to embarrass you, but I would love to pray for you. Are you at a place also where maybe you are a believer in Jesus Christ, your salvation is secured, but you know today needs to be a day where you just come to God and said, Lord, I return to you. I surrender my life to you anew from this day forward. I'm going to serve you for the rest of my life. We call that a rededication. Is today a day that you need to rededicate your life to Christ? If you're of either of those two groups, would you do me a favor and just raise your hand right where you're at with nobody looking around? I see your hand in the back, sir. I see your hand over there, ma'am. I see your hand over there, ma'am, and yours and yours. Thank you, Father. Is there anybody else? Don't miss this opportunity. I promise not to embarrass you, but I would love to join hands with you and pray with you. I pray, you know, if, 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 if you're dealing with some strong things, man, we've got to step out in faith. And I want to ask you to just run right up here to the front. People around you are going to clap. They're going to be excited for you. But come on up here. I'd love to join hands with you and pray with you right now. 
Give them a big round of applause. Journey, get fired up. God is good. God is good. God is good. God is good. Thank you for being here. Sister, God bless you. Stay right up here. God bless you. You can just stand right here. You can all face me. That's good. God bless you. Thank you for being here. God bless you, sister. God bless you. Come on right here. Come right up here. Lord, I just come together with these who are at the front and maybe just say this with me. Say it. Why doesn't everybody just repeat it out loud? Jesus, you are the son of the living God who died on a cross and rose again that we might have life. We renounce our sins. We lay them at your feet and we leave it there. We accept the forgiveness that comes in Jesus' name and we surrender our hearts to you. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for delivering us. Thank you for setting us free. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. God bless you guys. Congratulations. Give them another big round of applause. Hey, before you return to your seats, Pastor Don has some information to help you get some next steps. Give them one more big round of applause. Hey, we're going to sing one more song of worship together, then I'll come up and close in prayer. If you'd like to take communion by yourself or with your family, the communion elements are both to my left and my right. If you need to come and kneel down and spend time with God, feel free to do that. If you need to join hands with somebody, myself and others will be here at the front. We'd be happy to join hands with you and pray with you. Don't leave here the same way that you walked in. God wants to bring freedom into your life right this very moment in Jesus' name. Let us worship.
that you've been struggling with. For most of us, we don't have to search too hard. We know exactly what it is. Father, I come before you in the authority that you have given me as a believer in Jesus Christ. And I speak life over the people of Journey Church. Your word said that it is for freedom that we have been set free, that we are new creations in you. And I come against that which enslaves, that which binds, that which holds back, the people of Journey Church right now, and the one and only name that is above every other name, that name of Jesus. Lord, we cry out to you right now, and we say, let my people go in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray that you will make whatever those sins are distasteful to us as a people, that we would no longer be intrigued by them, that we would no longer be enslaved by them, Lord, for some who have been in bondage to these things for many, many years, I pray that this is the day that you would remove that bondage from their life in Jesus' name. Satan, you are a liar. You have no rights over the people of Journey Church. We bind you and your demonic powers and principalities from the lives of the people of Journey Church. You no longer have rights or authority to speak into their lives. We close the doors that maybe even they willingly opened we seal them right now. We sweep the house clean and we fill it with the power of the Holy Spirit and the blood of Jesus Christ. When that sin comes knocking back at your door, may the devil see a no vacancy sign on the wall that it's occupied by our abiding in the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Father, would you set people free in this place today? Would you continue to teach us how to pray? Would you continue to teach us how to walk in authority? Would we see things and understand things as you see them? Would you give us hearts to love the things that you love and to hate the things that you hate? Lord, may we leave this place and walk out on mission telling the world about what you've done for us and how good you are and that you want to set them free as well. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful day. Bring somebody back with you next week.